Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at a column from page number 6 of the Delhi edition. This column evaluates the current state of relations between India and China. The author of the column, Shashi Tharoor, argues that the current Chinese leadership firmly believes that the 21st century belongs to China alone and through its aggression and deceitful policy it has pushed india into a secondary position in the region he argues that the latest border tensions that broke out between india and china in the ladakh sector happens to be one of the lowest points in the relationship these border tensions that china initiated in 2020 continues to this day as only a partial disengagement was achieved from the military standoff such diplomatic and military tensions between the two countries is nothing new and from the very beginning that is from the 1950s itself such political tensions have persisted in the relationship after the prc or the people's republic of china was formed in 1949 india tried to open up a friendly relationship with the prc but very soon india would witness china's expansionist behavior which began with its annexation of tibet in 1950 as china edged closer to the indian borders and became an immediate neighbor of india with a long border it started challenging the validity of the border that existed between india and tibet from the early 1950s itself china would question the validity of the mcmohan line in the eastern sector along with disputing the borders in the aksai chin sector then as tensions escalated it even led to few border incursions and clashes but a bigger blow to the india china relationship came in 1959 following the uprising in tibet as tibetan refugees rose up in rebellion against the chinese state china crushed the rebellion with force thus triggering a massive refugee crisis in 1959 so as the tibetan refugees along with the dalai lama fled to india india accommodated the refugees along with the dalai lama and even allowed the tibetan government in exile to function out of india china saw this as a hostile move by india because in china's view india was accommodating its anti national elements eventually the series of political diplomatic and military tensions of the 1950s culminated in the 1962 war which had always been the lowest point in the relationship as the war ended with india's defeat and it was followed up by china with a close nexus with pakistan to create a series of strategic challenges for india which would persist for decades together while india had to deal with the combined threat posed by china and pakistan on the india china border front india also had to deal with a series of incursions and clashes throughout the 1960s 1970s and 1980s but then in the late 1980s a new era opened up in the india china relationship and the bilateral relations appeared to be on the upswing until 2019 this phase of improved relations began with the historic visit of then prime minister rajiv gandhi to china which was later followed up by prime minister narasimha rao's visit to china in the 1990s then the subsequent governments under prime minister vajpay and prime minister manmohan singh and even the current government under prime minister modi continue to believe that there was scope for improvement in the relationship with china during this period of improvement in relations india china both agreed that the border issue is too complex to be resolved and they even came to an acknowledgement that the border issue is something that has to be resolved by future generations and hence in the short to medium term they need to focus on improving their bilateral relations by placing the border conflict on the back burner china would even publicly state that the india china border dispute is something that can be resolved only by the future generations as a follow up to this several important border agreements were signed in the 1990s and as both the countries had liberalized and globalized their economies by now they started exclusively focusing on their trade and economic relations so over the last 2 to 3 decades the india china trade relationship has increased exponentially reaching a total volume of 100 billion dollars every year all the while china would make india believe that 
the border issue is truly on the back burner and in case of any misunderstanding due to the differing perceptions over the border de escalation and disengagement could always be achieved through the border agreements that had been put in place under this belief subsequent indian governments would adopt a strategy of not provocating china unnecessarily and in line with its principle of strategic autonomy which calls for a independent foreign policy india deliberately stayed away from any containment strategies of the west that was aimed at countering and restricting the rise of china but little did india realize that china was merely implementing its so called salami slicing technique through which it was deceiving india to make incremental gains over the border issue in geopolitics the salami slicing technique refers to a divide and conquer process which uses a mix of threats and alliances in order to overcome opposition under this strategy the aggressor can influence and eventually dominate a landscape in a gradual incremental piece by piece manner under this incremental strategy it is believed that china keeps making repeated incursions in order to consolidate and strengthen its position over a long period of time every now and then it makes these small incursions and after the tensions increases it appears ready to talk in order to work out a peaceful settlement but by the time the issue is settled china would have strengthened its position either by deploying more troops or by creating military infrastructure in the occupied areas so then this would become the new normal and with this as a starting point china will keep repeating these steps in a gradual incremental manner in order to fully consolidate its position in the disputed areas apparently india hasn't been able to counter the creeping annexation of china as it lacks the required diplomatic military and political tools to exert pressure on china if india were to get aggressive and get provocative against china then india would be risking a full blown out war with china which has always been the last resort for india so while china appeared to be improving relations with india for three decades it has incrementally pushed india back across several sectors and has slowly consolidated its position across the border take the latest clashes in ladakh for example across the line of actual control china opened up multiple pressure points against india including at the galwan river valley after months of military escalation on both the sides china appeared ready for talks and while partial disengagement and deescalation has been carried out parallelly china has effectively consolidated its position and reportedly it occupies around 900 square kilometers of indian territory through these incremental aggressions across the galwan valley china has pushed back its own claim lines beyond the galwan river valley and by pushing the indian troops back towards the shok river it has effectively cut off the galwan region thereby strengthening its hold over the region to this act of aggression india has responded through a few economic measures by banning several chinese mobile applications as they threatened india's data security and india also restricted the flow of investments from china into several key sectors but according to shashi tharoor these measures are ineffective and rather it could affect india because today india has become heavily dependent on the chinese economy chinese imports have become critical for several key sectors in india and it's a direct result of the economic opening that we carried out over the last 3 decades so across sectors such as telecom power equipment infrastructure and even pharmaceuticals indian firms have become heavily dependent on chinese imports and moreover such economic retaliation will have a minimal impact on china because its exports to india hardly accounts for 3% of its total exports whereas for india china is the largest trading partner and the critical dependency of multiple sectors will only affect india rather than having any impact on china so as india's retaliatory options have become limited india has been pushed by china to align with the western countries in breach of its own principle of strategic autonomy over the last couple of decades as india's ties with the us has improved and as india us have become closer in the defense and strategic domain 
India has been further pushed by China to abandon its independent foreign policy and align with Western interests and join multilateral platforms such as the quadrilateral. Over here, Shashi Tharoor points out that this is what gives China the leverage to get aggressive against India. Because on one hand, China knows very well that India has a critical economic dependency on Chinese imports. On the other hand, as India is forced to align with the US and the Western countries, China will get all the more reason to target India and justify its aggressiveness by pointing out that groupings such as quadrilateral have been designed to contain China and to restrict China's military and strategic ambitions in the region. So either ways, China is effectively pushing India on the back foot and it becomes clear that China's strategy is not just to put India in the secondary position in the Asia region, but also to force India to closely align with the Western countries and the United States, which gives China more space in the region to further power its aggressive rise to dominate the 21st century. Now let's take up another column from page number 6, written by Air Vice Marshal Manmohan Bahadur, who has also served as the additional Director General of the Center for Air Power Studies. In this column, he evaluates the state of professional military education in the country. Military education and training is crucial for the armed forces in preparing them not just for the world of combat, but also for the world of strategy and geopolitics. In this context, the writer quotes Sun Tzu, the legendary Chinese military strategist, writer and philosopher, who famously said that in order to win wars, you should not just know the enemy, but you should also know about yourself. To quote Sun Tzu, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. But if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Now, this is great military advice that is valid across generations. So the writer says that to win conflicts and to maintain strategic edge in geopolitics, the armed forces, that is all the three wings of the armed forces, along with India's strategic establishment, they should invest sufficiently to not just know the enemy, but also to evaluate the self. According to the writer, this knowing process is a three-step process. You begin by collecting information or gathering information on the enemy and as well as about yourself, that is with regard to your strength and weaknesses. Then you convert this information into usable knowledge through careful analysis and assessments. Then on the basis of this knowledge, you provide policy options to the leadership, that is to both civilian and military leadership at the national level to help them make the right decisions that would add to the country's military capabilities. So this process of collecting information, converting that into knowledge through analysis and assessments and developing policy options based on this knowledge is to be carried out by full-time domain specialists and experts who should ideally come from a mix of civilian and military background. Such analysts and experts should be drawn from the world of academics, including theorists and strategic experts. Such full-time domain specialists should also be drawn from amongst the practitioners of military doctrine that is both serving and retired military officials. Because only then you would be able to get a fine mix of academic knowledge and operational experience, which in turn directly translates to better training, better education, and better assessments and better policy options for the leadership. In several advanced countries like France and the United States, this is the model that they follow. In their military training establishments and in their war schools and colleges, the instructors would be from a mix of civilian and military background and they not only rely upon serving military officers, but they also draw retired military officers from all the three branches of the armed forces as they can bring in their immense operational experience and practical knowledge. These countries, they even rely upon strategic experts from the field of academics and even civilian theorists and practitioners are brought into these schools. And over a period of time, each of these experts, they develop their own subject domain knowledge and they go on to specialize in a particular domain of warfare. 
such focus on specialization is what provides for advanced level of training in the military training institutions of France and the United States. In the case of India, this task falls upon institutions such as the National Security Council Secretariat and the National Security Advisory Board, which are a part of the National Security Council. Even think tanks such as the Niti Aayog and government funded think tanks like IDSA, they all play a role in this knowledge creation, which in turn helps in framing policy options for the leadership and as well as provides for the training of future warriors in our defense schools and colleges. But unfortunately, in these Indian institutions, there is no scope for full-time domain specialization as these institutions largely rely upon part-time experts and they provide for a very limited role to the outsiders. Currently, the training schools and colleges are largely manned by serving officials who serve only for a short term. So this doesn't create enough opportunities for serving officials to develop full-time specialization and domain-level expert knowledge. On the other hand, retired officials and civilian academicians and theorists and strategic experts, they are only brought in as outside instructors or outside experts for used only for conducting guest lectures. So as a result, the lack of focus on specialization and domain-level knowledge has led to the poor design of our military training and education institutions and even their courses and curriculum is not well drafted. Hence, the writer is calling for reforms at defense training institutions such as the Defense Services Staff College and the various colleges and schools run by the three branches of the armed forces. Even though a beginning has been made in this regard, the focus on full-time domain specialization is very limited to few institutions. The writer even wonders as to what happened to the ambitious Indian Defense University, which was launched in 2013, which was supposed to come up at Gurugram. Even though the foundation for this institution was laid, the Ministry of Defense has been dragging its feet and the establishment of such an elite institution has fallen behind. Whereas the Ministry of Home Affairs, on the other hand, which deals with internal security, has recently established the Rashtriya Raksha University in Gujarat which reportedly has made a beginning in this regard. At the Rashtriya Raksha University, civilian academics, serving police and military officials and even retired officials are being brought in to run courses across different subjects of specialization. And this should serve as a model for the Ministry of Defense as well to fast track the establishment of the Indian Defense University. The writer concludes by stating that strategic thinking can be ingrained amongst the armed forces and our military capabilities can be strengthened to give us a geopolitical advantage only if the national leadership that is both civilian and military leadership and the military education system when they have access to full-time domain specialists. Now let's look at this article from page number one. The union cabinet has approved a series of major reforms in the telecom sector which is expected to bring huge relief to telecom companies. The first major reform is with regard to the definition of AGR or adjusted gross revenue. See, the issue of AGR has been a subject of debate and litigation since several years. In 1994, when the national telecom policy was announced, the telecom companies, they were expected to pay a fixed license fee every year. But later, the telecom companies couldn't pay the agreed fees and hence they agreed to pay a percentage of their AGR to the government as revenue. But now the question was, what would be the definition of AGR? How would you determine AGR? AGR is essentially the annual revenue from all the carriers which combined together accrues to the government as its revenue. But the exact definition of what entails AGR has been contentious since 2003. According to telecom companies, AGR should include only the revenue that they are generating by providing telecom services. But the telecom department has argued that AGR should cover a broader definition and include not just telecom revenue but also non-telecom revenue. For computing AGR, the telecom department has insisted that all forms of revenue earned by a service provider 
should be included such as rent profit on sale of fixed assets sale of scrap corporate deposits real estate transactions handset sales dividend income etc so as per the definition of the telecom department agr would have a broader coverage thereby increasing the burden on the telecom companies as they were expected to pay massive dues to the government this eventually became a subject of litigation of the supreme court and several cases have been fought over the exact definition of agr and what dues do the telecom companies owe to the government in 2003 a few companies approached the telecom disputes settlement and appellate tribunal and they questioned the definition of agr later the matter reached the supreme court and after several cases and hearings last year the supreme court ruled that telecom companies they owe agr dues to the tune of nearly 1.6 lakh crore rupees to the government and these dues will have to be paid over a period of next 10 years along with interest so essentially the supreme court had upheld the definition provided by the department of telecom so this ruling which went against the telecom companies had placed huge burden on them and had severely restricted their financial resources hence to provide relief to these companies the union cabinet has taken a landmark decision and it has decided to redefine agr by excluding non telecom revenue so with the exclusion of non telecom revenue the burden on the companies will go down and along with that to provide further relief to the companies the government has announced a four year moratorium on the payment of these dues back to the government but however industry experts are arguing that this is only a temporary relief because eventually the companies after the four year moratorium period they will have to pay back the dues that to along with interest but the industry has welcomed the decision of the government to redefine agr by excluding non telecom revenue along with this the government has taken several decisions to pave the way for investments in 5g technology by allowing for 100% fdi through the automatic route previously in the telecom sector fdi was allowed under the automatic route only to the extent of 49% any investment beyond that required the approval of the government as the government saw the telecom sector crucial to the country's national security but now to liberalize the telecom sector and to pave the way for investments in 5g technology the government has decided to allow 100% fdi through the automatic route then upon that it has fixed a calendar for auctioning telecom spectrum and accordingly spectrum auctions will be held in the last quarter of every financial year thereby bringing more stability and clarity to the country's telecom policy according to the government these reforms have been designed to help india achieve its digital ambitions and drive the country towards a digital india next we have an article on page number 1 and an infographic on page number 7 that brings out the crime statistics as per the report that has been brought out by the national crime records bureau some of these statistics and facts can be relevant for prelims and mains so let's take a look at some of the key highlights of the report according to the report the number of crimes recorded in the country has gone up by 28% for the year 2020 as compared to 2019 the sudden jump in the number of criminal cases registered is a direct result of the pandemic and the lockdown because most of these cases are related to lockdown violations the report points out that lakhs of criminal cases have been registered for flouting covid-19 protocols and norms and a sharp increase has been noted in cases registered under disobedience to order duly promulgated by a public servant under section 188 of the indian penal code similarly several offenses have been registered under the epidemic diseases act of 1897 through which the states were empowered to impose the lockdown restrictions so due to a sudden surge in the number of cases under these provisions last year we have witnessed a 28% jump in the registration of criminal cases then according to the report crimes against scheduled castes has gone up by 9.4% with cases related to simple hurt criminal intimidation and as well as violation of the provisions of the prevention of atrocities act 
but however there is a dip registered with regard to sedition cases following heavy criticism against the misuse of sedition laws then another important statistic is that violent crimes kidnappings and abductions have declined but however cases of assault against women with the intention of outraging their modesty has gone up according to this table there has been a fall in serious violent crimes being reported and while murder cases have gone up by 1% cases of rape kidnapping and abduction crime against children and robbery have all seen a decline then even the charge sheet rate for the police has gone up and with a nearly 75% charge sheeting rate the police have registered the highest rate of charge sheeting in the last 5 years then the conviction rate at courts has stood at 59.2% which also happens to be the highest conviction rate in the last 5 years and the report also points out that a majority of the criminal cases that have been registered they have been registered under the ipc or the indian penal code then finally another important fact is that tamil nadu has registered the highest crime rate in the country which is nothing but the number of crimes per 1 lakh population tamil nadu is followed by kerala and delhi and these three states have reported the highest crime rate in the country whereas sikkim manipur and nagaland have reported the lowest crime rate with india's national average crime rate standing at 487.8 cases per 1 lakh population now let's look at this article from page number 12 the united states united kingdom and australia have announced the formation of a new trilateral partnership known as aukus it essentially stands for australia united kingdom and the us and through this trilateral partnership these three countries have formed a new security grouping which will primarily focus on the indo pacific region this key development comes just a weeks ahead of the quadrilateral summit which is slated to be hosted by the us at the white house when the leaders of india australia and japan would be visiting the us to take part in the un general assembly summit this new initiative that has been announced between us uk and australia would essentially be a strategic grouping that would focus on maritime security aspects of the indo pacific region one of the key pillars of the aukus initiative would be to enable australia procure nuclear powered submarines with technical assistance coming in from the united kingdom and the us see until recently australia had never expressed ambitions for procuring nuclear powered submarines it had even signed a contract with france for procuring conventional diesel electric submarines but now with the rising aggression of china in the indo pacific region and due to increasing rivalry between china and australia in the region australia has entered into a close security embrace with the united states while these two countries have formed the quadrilateral with india and japan they have now created a new trilateral grouping with the united kingdom which is also equally interested in countering china in the indo pacific these three countries have stated that the aukus grouping will focus on establishing a rules based order in the indo pacific and in order to enable australia protect the international order in the indo pacific they would be helping australia procure nuclear powered submarines under the aukus initiative they are likely to expand their strategic engagement into possible joint military exercises and joint technological projects with a clear intention to counter the rising influence of china in the indo pacific now let's look at the main practice questions the first question for the current chinese leadership the 21st century is destined to be china's alone where does this leave india evaluate the second question analyze the significance of full time domain specialists in professional military education for the indian armed forces kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the answer writing portal for which the link shall be shared in the description box below so this concludes our discussion for today thanks for watching